If I go too far, please tell me and I'll slow down. Um, this is, I'm going to talk about active active firewall support in OpenBSD. So, this is, yes, the introduction. Um, basically, who I am, what is OpenBSD, if anyone doesn't know that already, what are PF and PF sync, um, what's the difference between active active and active passive. Um, the problem with the current situation and the solutions I came up with and um, some results in there. So, who am I? Um, I'm a core developer in the OpenBSD project. My email address is dlg at openbsd.org. You can send email to it, not spam. It doesn't seem to get through anyway. Um, I've had a lot of experience writing device drivers for hardware, particularly PCI devices, particularly SCSI and ACA and that part of the network stack. I am relatively new at working on networking, especially in the middle of the network stack. I have written network device drivers before, which was fun, but anything above that, very new to me. Um, that's what I do for OpenBSD. My actual proper job is a systems programmer at the University of Queensland. And I run all the computers, really, at a school at UQ called the Information Technology and Electrical Engineering School. And particularly relevant at the moment is I run the firewalls there. Um, we currently have two OpenBSD boxes acting as one firewall, and they do some pretty crazy stuff. We used to have something like 2700 rules, and with the recent PF stuff and some optimization, I got it down to about 600, which is pretty cool. Um, what is OpenBSD? Does anyone not know what OpenBSD is? <laughs> that guy in the orange shirt at the back, for your benefit. <laughs> it's a general purpose Unix op like operating system. It's descended from the original Unix by way of the BSD and NetBSD in particular, and those are the, are the aims according to the, uh, the web page. It must be true. <laughs> Never um, That's where it started from. Where it's got to now is it's evolved into a platform for a lot of new uh, network services. It can do other things, but the majority of interest within the project tends to have been in the networking area, and that's reflected by the number of developers who we have working on the network stack, which is probably something like a quarter of them or something. It's kind of annoying having 20 new people hacking on the same file at the same time, but somehow we get through it. Um, we do have a lot of users running routers and firewalls on OpenBSD. A lot of them. Claudio, is that true? Yeah, it must be true. I really um, part of the services that OpenBSD provides um, in the networking area is a firewall called PF, which is simply short for packet filter. Um, we used to have Darren Reed's IP filter, however, there was a clarification made to the terms of the license which caused it to be removed from the source tree. Um, that was actually pretty shocking to me because the main reason I used OpenBSD all that time ago was to NAT basically, my internet connection at home, and all of a sudden I couldn't do it. But I was quite young at the time, and I was unable to do anything about it except cry in my sleep. Fortunately, a guy called Daniel Hartmeyer came along and started PF, um, which it was kind of amazing to watch how fast that thing started up. Um, IP filter disappeared, and within weeks or a month or something, PF was there, and by the next release, we had something usable. Well, for me, it was usable for what I wanted to do. Um, it's, nowadays, it has an extremely powerful filter language, which ties into hugely diverse parts of the system. I mean, in PF, it's now possible to filter traffic based on the UID of the process that's creating it. I don't know of anything else that can do it at the moment. Um, PF also lets you, has consumed other parts of the system, so like alt queue used to have its own separate policy engine for figuring out which traffic should be assigned to which queues. So in effect, we had two packet policy classification systems that was merged into PF, and it's a lot more natural to work with now. You can just say, in one file, what happens to your traffic? It gets past blocks, it gets slower, it gets faster, the latency is increased, it randomly drops, all this sort of stuff in PF. Um, but that's the rule set. So I found this awesome quote on the internet, which of course must be true again. Um, PF is a stateful firewall, but um, it can operate stateless. But According to this website, the difference between stateful and stateless firewalls are stateless firewalls are typically faster and perform better under heavy traffic loads. Um, stateful firewalls are better at identifying unauthorized and unfortunate communications. 
that's not true for PF just because of how it handles its state full traffic. Um, PF is generally faster than other stateless firewalls, which is pretty amazing. Um, to actually explain what I mean by this, I think I'm going way too fast. <laughs> um, stateless firewalling. Um, Filtering is only done by a rule set. So everyone here is familiar with the PF configuration file? Yeah. It's just a list of rules that say if the traffic matches these characteristics, such as the networks, the IP addresses, the ports, um, which protocol it is, um, the TTL on the packet, that sort of thing, then it's allowed to go through the system or it's blocked by the system. Um, with stateless firewalling, you have to construct a rule set that expresses where the traffic can, uh, you have to say that traffic will be able to flow in both directions for a valid connection. So every packet through the filter will be evaluated by the rule set individually. Um, there are two problems with this. The first one is that, like I said before, the rule set has to allow traffic in both directions. So if you want people inside your network to talk to web servers outside, you have to have a rule that says that the packets going out can go out, which is the first rule there. So pass out from anything inside to anything, well, from a high port to anything outside on a port 80. However, once they've sent the packet out, the web server is going to send packets back into us. So we have to pass in from the connection made to port 80 back to any connection on port greater than 1024. Now the problem with that is things outside can get packets into us using that second rule without us actually asking for them. Does everyone understand the problem with that? Yeah. I'll take that as a well, steps up the front isn't really paying attention. <laughs> um, the problem with apart from being um, apart from unwanted packets being able to come in without you asking for them, in the PF context rule set evaluation is slow because we have a list of rules um, and we have the policy that the last match wins or it short circuits with the quick step, that sort of stuff. Um, the rule set evaluation is slow because you take the packet and then you run through all the rules with it. So typically the cost of evaluating the rule set is roughly ON, where N is the number of rules. So the bigger your rule sets, the more time it's going to take to evaluate it. Now we do have some optimization, so that's not strictly true um, in the real world sense, but Realistically, if you do have a large rule set, it's going to take a long time to evaluate it. Um, every single packet through the system therefore gets evaluated by the rule set. Now, the difference between one of the other differences between IP filter and PF is that um, packets going through a computer will go through PF twice once coming into the box and once coming out of the box. So it gets worse with PF because you're actually running the rule set twice for every packet, which is still ON. <laughs> can't say O2N. Um, <laughs> there are different algorithms that other people have experimented with. Um, for example, I think it was a Cisco guy who implemented something in Linux where every packet was passed up to use on it, and they hashed the packet together to get a memory offset. Then they just went to that page in memory to figure out a bit that said whether the packet was allowed to pass or fail. So they were just using a big set representation of all the possible traffic on the internet to figure out whether it was allowed to go or not. Now, that's computationally quite cheap, but in memory terms, it's extremely expensive. Um, there are other shortcuts you can do, but um, PF rule sets no longer just select the pass-fail state of a packet. They do other classification as well. For example, the alt Q stuff. So it's not like we can represent the pass-fail state in memory as a bit somewhere. We actually have to have a lot of context associated with the outcome of our evaluation, which, again, would blow the memory so that's just how the rule set is in OpenBSD, and from what I, I imagine, it's going to stay like that forever. Stateful firewalling, on the other hand, um, the firewall, in a typical routing sense, each packet is evaluated independent of everything else. Um, an IP packet is stateless compared to the, any, um, anything else. So if you're just doing plain routing, you just have to know where it's going to go. You don't have to know anything about the previous packets for that session. Stateful firewalls, on the other hand, um, they have a memory of flows going through the firewall. Um, those state, 
that memory is stored in a red black tree. So instead of iterating over a rule set, it simply takes the characteristics of the packet, like the protocol, the address family, the ports, the addresses, and um, uses that as a key to look up a red black tree. Now, the cost of doing a lookup in red black is O log n. So um, my firewalls at work tend to sit between 10 and 30,000 rules, and that means they do on average, it's 15. Can't do maths in my head. It's a very small number of um, comparisons compared to actually evaluating my 900 rule rule set. So they do a dozen or so comparisons as opposed to 400 comparisons for the rule. So stateful firewalling for us is a lot faster. Make sense? Yeah. Um, the side effect of that is filter rules only have to allow connections to start which means you can write a rule like pass out on my interface from any to port 80, and that's it. The rule set just has to allow the start of the connection. It will create a state from that, and any traffic going back will be looked up in the state table instead, uh, be associated with uh, an existing state and allowed to pass back through. It's a lot faster. Um, the other good thing is, once we know more about the session, in TCP, we can keep track of the TCP windows as well. And so we can better match a packet to its state, which meaning that packets that have spoof values for those other things are more likely to be rejected simply because it's, there's a much smaller space for the attacker to fit their spoof values into. Which Theo would nod his head sometimes, so I'm, I know I'm telling the truth. Um, so I have this really cool diagram which sort of shows how stateful firewalls work. So the client builds a packet and it sends it through the firewall. The firewall then creates a state for it and forwards it onto the server. The server then builds its reply with similar characteristics and sends it through the firewall. Because it's the same shape, it's allowed to forward it back through to the client. Everyone claps at this point in my mind. Yes. Um, there are problems with stateful filing. It's not all good news. The disadvantage is that we can't have packets um, going through an identical box next to it because it doesn't have the state table. So existing packets within an existing connection will get blocked because the rule set blocks them because the states just aren't there on the other peer. So this is extremely bad if you wanted to have a spare box next to your actual firewall for failover purposes, or if you wanted to take one down for maintenance and patch it and bring it up again. Um, or load balancing. Or load balancing, yeah. Well, it's bad news for load balancing, which I'll get back to soon. <laughs> um, the obvious solution to this is to make sure that the state table gets shared between all the firewalls. So this is what happens without state sharing, I believe. The client builds a packet, sends it through the firewall, which builds the state entry, and sends it onto the server. The server then builds a reply, and um, let's just say firewall B blows up at this point in time. I don't have a cool animation for that, but I do have a cool animation for what happens to the packet. So the server forwards it onto firewall A, just because it's there, and it's supposed to do the job, but because the state entry doesn't exist, the packet gets dropped. And yeah, your connection no longer works. So the method that was produced several years ago was a protocol called PFSync. Um, it exists solely to share the state table between PF firewalls. That's all it does. Um, it is a simple IP protocol. I mean, it's a raw IP packet with an IP header, but there's nothing inside it that claims it's UDP or TCP or anything like that. It's just datagrams. Um, inside the kernel, there's a chunk of code which is PF, and there's another chunk of code which is the PFSync implementation. Um, at various points in time, PF will tell PFSync about changes to states. So anytime a new packet comes into the system, we update the state. Um, the code that updates the state will then pass it to PFSync, so PFSync can then share that information with everyone else. Um, those state changes are typically insert, update, and delete. Those three actions get told to PFSync. Um, PFSync then remembers the information about that state and makes a decision about when to send the updates to its peers. Now this works great for failover, empirically. And this 
is what PFSync is supposed to do. So the client builds its packet, sends it through the firewall. Um, the firewall gives the state to PFSync, and PFSync then decides to send a copy of it to firewall A. The server then builds its reply and tries to send it to firewall A, and fortunately it works because it has the state entry now. That's how PFSync works. Cool? But there's a reason. I'm getting to that. <laughs> So the problem is PFSync tries to mitigate. Um, in the current implementation, despite the fact that you tell PFSync about a state change, it will not actually send it out immediately. It will try to mitigate. And there are several conditions um, which it stops mitigating. The first one and most relevant to this discussion is it will wait a second from that first update before sending the packet out. And the reason it tries to mitigate is so it can bundle multiple state updates into a single PFSync frame. Or sing several updates to a single PF state into a single message inside a PF sync frame. Um, this isn't really a problem in failover from how many years have we had PF sync now? It's like five, a long time. We've had PF sync for a long time and people have been using it in failover situations without problems. Um, but it's bad from an active active point of view and it's like this guy says, because of a race. So we have the packet go out, we have the reply build, but the problem is time passes before that state is synced over. And as you saw before, the reply was destroyed before the state was sent out. Now, why is this a problem? Because in real networks, you do lose packets. Why can't we just cope with the failure to lose that packet? Um, the problem is some protocols really like having all of their packets, every single one of them. Um, if, you don't, if it doesn't get it, it's going to retry it. Um, it's both that problem with the state being sent over for the first packet is also a problem for the packets after the first one. So for TCP in particular, as you move the windows forward, because of the checks PF does on those TCP windows, you have to tell the peer about it so it will allow the replies through. You have to tell it at roughly similar time scales to what the actual window moves forward in because of how strict our checks are. We do have some fuzz in the checks because it's necessary, but we don't have enough fuzz. And if we make the fuzz bigger, we're going to compromise on the security of the firewall. So one of the requirements for this whole project of mine was that we don't compromise on the restrictiveness of PF. Um, as I said, PF checks more than the address family protocol and ports for TCP. It also checks the state of TCP. So whether you're opening the connection or the connection's been established, um, whether it's closed or not, and it checks the sequence numbers within those states. So TCP, you have to have packets within a certain window. As you move out of that window, it'll drop them because it's not expecting them. But as the PF sees them, it will update the expected window values, and it will keep track of them. It's basically TCP state tracking. And both sides, both if you have two firewalls, both of them need to know the exact same information to be able to deal with the traffic in a timely fashion. Um, as I said before, PFSync mitigates. It handles, yeah, it'll send a packet out after a second about one it received that second ago. That's just too slow. So the obvious solution is to make PFSync share its updates more rapidly. And that's the simple solution. Now, why do we want to do this? Active active firewalls are a really easy and cheap way to increase throughput between networks. If you get two routers, ignore PF for a moment, if you get two routers and put them between two networks, it's possible for any host to send traffic through either of them. So if you engineer your network correctly, you just put half the hosts on one of the firewalls and then the other half on the other firewalls, and you've suddenly got, sorry, not firewalls, routers, you've suddenly got twice the bandwidth through between the networks. Okay? It's easy. Um, with OpenBSC in, in particular, there are some technologies in there like the CARP load balancing stuff where each firewall can have the same IP address but it will only respond to half the traffic. So it's a really cheap, easy way to have one firewall that looks, is actually made up of several and increase the throughput between networks without changing much of your actual other network design policy. So, and that scales even wider. If you want to scale it to four gateways between networks and stick with one IP address, CARP will let you do that. However, if you start doing stateful firewalling, it's not going to work because of that birthing problem I showed you previously. As soon as 
you have a network situation where a single TCP session is sent over one of the firewalls and receives over the other firewalls, the traffic's going to stall simply because the PFSync updates don't move fast enough for the other firewall to know that the next packet is valid. Right. So I had two goes of this. The first one was in N2K9, which was held in Japan last year. It was a great time. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do. I really just packed my clothes, got on a plane, and turned up the next day after doing some really busy stuff. I think I just finished a semester at uni, and I had no idea what I was going to do. But um, somehow we came up with the idea that we'd like to do active, active, safe, or file one. So I spent the week just tinkering the code, learning PF, PF sync, figuring out what to do. Um, at the end of the week, the modifications we made were to the existing implementation. So we did two basic updates at the end of the week. We went through a lot of other ideas, but we ended up with two basic changes to PF sync to cope with it. What we did is the state inside the kernel that PF holds about a TCP connection, we put a timestamp on it. That timestamp was updated when we received a PF sync packet about it. So um, with that, we could figure out if PF is trying to update the same state that PF sync had tried to update within four seconds, then we know we have asynchronous traffic paths and we can respond to it. It's a very simple change. The other change we made was, um, oh, we made three changes, sorry. The second one was um, there's some code that figures out if it should reject the update from PF sync peer. If we've received updates to the state locally, after the peer has, then we were going to have more present information. So we have code in the PF sync that um, rejects state updates that we have better information for. The problem with that is TCP is sort of, um, it has two sides to it. And we were previously rejecting all sides of the information if any of them were out of date. So it was modified so that each half of it was considered independent of the other. So basically, if one firewall updates one side of the TCP connection, we would accept that update rather than both updates. Does that make sense? Cool. See more nuts than shaking your head. Must be true. Um, the stake birthing rates was still a problem with the changes we made. They were just less likely. Um, so we introduced a new PF sync message that. Um, when you insert a state and you think it's going to be split, you put a bit on it that says, I need an acknowledgement for this insert. While we do that, we also keep that initial packet for the state creation inside the kernel until we receive an acknowledgement from the peer. So in effect, we're delaying the sending of the initial packet until all the other firewalls in the cluster say that they've got information about it. The other side to that is, um, it's possible that we're going to be able to only firewall at that, that point in time, like at one of our peers might have failed. So there's also a timeout that says if you haven't received an acknowledgement from your peers within a short period of time, just send the packet out and hope for the best. Um, in the, yeah, I'll get back to that later. The problem with this was though, um, now that we had figured out when we were in a split brain situation for a single PF sync packet, um, we were starting to send a huge amount of PF sync um, updates between the things. So every time PF discovered that it had a split state, it would mark the PF sync update as immediate. I, as soon as you get an update from PF sync for the state, you set the timestamp. PF then updates that state and then goes, oh, it's split. I have to send the update out immediately. The way PF sync was engineered at the time, it would send that update out as soon as that condition was met. So this became a problem because PF evaluates a packet twice. Once coming into the box, it would go, oh, that state's been now split. I'll send an update about it. That's on the IP input side. It then sends it to IP output, which tries to update the state again and goes, oh, that's a split brain one. I have to send the packet out immediately. So for every packet going through the box, we would send, at the start, two PF sync packets on their own. The other problem was um, because they were now hitting the split merge update case, we would go, well, your half of the information is better than ours, but our other half is better than yours, so we're going to tell you about it. So for every 
update we received from those two initial passes through PF from one PF, we would then send another packet out. So every single packet going through a PF firewall that had filtering on both in and out was generating four packets. Our PF sync traffic was suddenly four times that of the forwarded packets per second, which is ridiculous. We were doing like um, 500 kilobytes a second of TCP traffic in a single TCP session. We were doing two meg of PF sync traffic. Not good. This exposed further problems in the PF sync code. The problem is um, PF sync will tell its peers about the three changes we make, the inserts, updates, and the deletes. The protocol that was defined in the previous implementation, you could only put one of those messages in a packet at a time. And the way that they were built, um, we would only begin building packets of that one type in the kernel. And as soon as we had to switch the message type, we would just send the one we were previously building out and start again. So in normal operation, ignoring the active-active case, if you have a firewall that's doing a lot of existing connections and you get a fairly rapid turnover of new connections and old connections, you're going to be sending more packets than you need to simply because it's switching the message type. You get an existing packet for a connection through the box, that's fine. Then you get a new one, it's going to send the previous PF sync update out, build the insert, put it into a packet, and then the next packet you're going to get is for an existing state and it'll send out the update for the insert. And it'll start building updates again. It, it sucks, basically. The other problem with the packet generation was um, as soon as PF updated the packet with PF sync, it would write the packet out in memory. So it would start off by allocating the biggest packet it's ever going to possibly send, which is about 2K usually. And it would write the region in the packet um, immediately. The problem with that is when it comes along later to update the same state again, what it actually did is it iterated over the packet that it already built in memory to figure out if it's already got an update in there. So every time a packet went into PF sync, you'd have this ON evaluation of the existing packet to see if you've already had a state update about it. So, which is kind of slow. So, at the end of N2K9, I ran out of time. I got on a plane to come home and I went back to study again. Didn't have much time to work on this. Um, but I knew enough at that point to devise how I wanted the second attempt at like, solving this problem to go. The solution was basically to re-engineer a huge chunk of the code. And since I'm going to have to re-engineer a lot of the code to work around the problem that I just described, um, why not just fix the protocol while we're at it? It's not going to be that much. So the only real change between the previous implementation of PF Sync and the new one I did is I added a little subheader. So you can have multiple messages inside the same packet. That's good. I brought in the changes I described before from the first solution. So we did timestamp the states within PF, saying when they were last updated by PF Sync, and I also added the deferred send and INAC stuff. So um, the IAC stuff will simply dissolve the burping rates. However, instead of figuring out this is a split state, I must send the update out immediately for my peer, I defer the updates to the end of softnet. Now, what is softnet? Does, is everyone okay with the interrupt handling inside BSD kernels? <laughs> um, technically, softnet is an interrupt priority level. It sort of is, but for the purposes of this discussion, it is. Um, the network stack in OpenBSD and presumably the other BSDs is split. Now, the top half of it is for hard network stuff, which is the actual handling of physical devices. Now, physical devices, all they have to do is push packets onto their transmit queues and pull packets off their receive queues. Um, they do that at a very high level. Once they dequeue packets, they put them onto a queue and then say, run softnet which is a software interrupt handler. Um, on busy systems, well, what the hardware interrupt handlers try to do is take as many packets off the hardware as possible and shove as many packets down into softnet as possible. Um, so on busy systems, a softnet call will handle multiple packets. What this means for PF sync um, PF runs as part of the stack at softnet. So if we get multiple packets in at softnet in one go and we defer the send of the PF sync update, that means 
we can collect as many updates as we can for all the packets that were represented in that single call to softnet and send the sum of those updates out at the end of it. We can collect multiple PF updates. So this immediately solves the problem where um, we would send two PF sync packets out for every one going through the system immediately. So um, on top of that, because um, PF sync input packets are also processed at softnet, the half state updates that we figured out in that interrupt were also coalesced as well. So generally, instead of sending four packets out, we're now down to one for however many packets we get at softnet. And typically with high-speed TCP connections, you'll actually end up with three or four or six or seven packets for the same TCP session inside the same softnet handle. So we get even better savings. And because we can now put multiple messages inside the same packet, we don't have to flip between message types all the time, and we can cram it down even more. So, um, ignoring the active-active again, if you just have an active-passive failover situation, you're going to get benefits from this code immediately because of this coalescing. You know, a friend of mine who runs the computers at the University of Alberta, he has this insane mail cluster which accepts something like a million SMTP connections a day, and goodness knows how many IMAP connections and all that sort of stuff. So he has a really rapid turnover of TCP sessions and state creations and deletions over the period of a day. Um, in some situations, he was seeing a reduction of up to, yeah, he was seeing a quarter of the PFC traffic compared to the previous implementation just because of this update, which is great. Um, the other thing, yeah. In actual code terms, the send out handle was implemented as a new softnet handler. So within softnet, there are actually several interrupt handlers which are run. Um, it starts with the IP one, does the IPv6 one, does the different address families, Bluetooth and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's a cool one at the end called the trend navigation, which is a topic for another talk. Um, as part of this update, I also did some other things. So instead of building the packet as updates happen to it in memory, I simply put the PF states on queues inside PF sync. And then I mark the PF state with which queue it's on at the time. So to figure out whether or not I've already um, scheduled the state for update, I don't have to repass the packet repeatedly. I simply just look at this one byte in the PF state and it tells me whether it's on the queue, which queue, and yeah, basically. Um, I also re-implemented the input parsing code, so instead of falling through a switch state to figure out which message I'm up to, it just looks up an array based on the message ID type, which theoretically should be faster, assuming the compiler sucks. Um, yeah, um, the change was 4,000 lines. It was a really, really big rewrite of the PFSync code. The file was about 1800 lines, it still is 1800 lines, but very new shiny lines, and there were changes to other parts of the system. So, um, results active, active works. Um, yes. I can now have completely stateful firewalling and async paths over it. So, I can get two firewalls, I can send the TCP packet to one firewall, and I can get a reply on the other firewall. The update will happen relatively immediately, so the next packets in the connection will work as well. So it actually works. The problem is, because of the deferrals I do, like it's, this is a compromise. Um, the speed of the PF sync updates, even despite the fact that I'm sending them out pretty regularly, the fact that I'm deferring them to the end of the um, softnet means that I can only cope with a certain number of packets per second going over the async parts and it's tied very heavily to the number of PF sync messages I can send over. Now, there are a lot of factors that influence this, ranging from how fast your machine is and how you know, crappy your interrupt controller is through to how you the interrupt mitigation on your actual network card works, and you know, there's a huge number of factors of a very multi-dimensional problem to figure out where the cutoffs are and what the balance is. But um, on my system with the Intel Gigabit controllers, in OpenBSD, it's limited to 8,000 interrupts a second on any Intel network card. So if I go beyond that 8,000 packets per second forwarded through the box, I can't get beyond that because of the PFC being mitigated to 8,000 messages a second. 
but that's for a single TCP connection. If I have multiple TCP connections and they all are uh, each 8,000 packets per second, the interrupt mitigation will not hurt them. So I can do 8,000 packets per second for individual TCP sessions. You just have to do lots of them in a wide thing. You can't get one very fast 40,000 packets per second TCP connection. But that's particular to my hardware. Your hardware is going to behave differently because the interrupt mitigation that interrupts, or, yeah, it's all completely different. You have to test to see how this affects you. However, it is all much, much better than zero packets per second, which is the previous case. It is definitely better than stalling. Um, if you're very careful about engineering your network so that the send, I'll get to you later, the sends and the receives come back on the same leg of the firewall, you're not going to get hurt by the PFSync traffic because the firewall that's handling the traffic knows everything about the traffic. So if you're able to engineer your network so TCP sessions send and receive over the same leg of your firewall, you're going to be fine. But since you can't control what the sender is going to, which one of your firewalls is, it's going to pick to send the traffic over, you need to cope with the worst case situation, which is that, which is what my code does. So we don't fail when you have a weird situation, we just degrade. And how you degrade depends very much on the hardware you're using and your version of the operating system and stuff. As a bonus to this, like I said before, PFSync is now less resource intensive for the previous active passive setups. A quarter of the packets per second for PFSync is a very big win. I'm seeing similar stuff on my phone also work if I don't do nearly the same as the U of A. Um, this is stuff I have done. A huge chunk of the code has already made it into the OpenBSD source tree. So the rewrite of the protocol handling and the statement um, and the parsing and all that sort of stuff, the majority of that 4,000 line diff was committed to the OpenBSD source tree only a matter of weeks ago, and it is going to make the 4.5 release. So your existing firewalls you can upgrade on, and you will get less packets per second for PFSync. However, there are two changes left which I haven't put into the tree because of some nickel issues with them that will let you work with active active. The first one is um, the half state merge update processing is kind of complicated. Um, it's very easy to get into a situation where both sides of the firewalls just scream at each other saying they've got better information about the same state. Um, the worst case that can happen is like I get on my firewall where the forwarded traffic is like 1,000 packets per second, the PFSync thing on each side and it thinks it knows better, and it will just send 40,000 PFSync updates between them. It'll try to sync up that stuff with 1,000 packets with 40,000 of its own packets, which is ridiculous. The box gets completely forward just doing PFSync for no good reason. So my detection of when the half stat state updates should occur is still being worked on, definitely. The other problem is my IAC handling um, I should probably figure out whether I need to defer the acknowledgement of the packet when I do the insert from PF into PFSync, but I do it much later. The problem with that is it's still possible for the insert to go out before I request the acknowledgement for it. So the peers don't know that they have to send the IAC back, so I always hit the timeout. If I ping through the firewalls with the IAC handling I have currently set up now, the first packet always takes 0.1 seconds to get through but the rest are fine because the state's been created at that point. Um, delaying 0.1 seconds is not acceptable in production, so I haven't got that working yet. Um, I still have to do a bit of testing to ensure there's no loss of functionality or reliability. It's quite hard to get the community involved with that unless you commit it to the source tree and make them use it, so that's what we've done. Um, and after that, I get those two fixes into the source tree and you're able to do active active. Um, I would have a demo, however, I wouldn't have time to prepare one, and I brought two t-shirts with me, not two computers, so yeah, I can't really show you this in action. You're just going to have to trust me. Does anyone have any questions at all? Yes. Yeah, I found this question. Uh, what's a good or rather uh, an approximate range of modern hardware to spend per second per session? What do you mean? Well, you have 8,000. Yeah. So well, what's the general range? That's particular to the Intel Gigabit driver in our BSD. There's a it just clamped all of the Intel Gigabit cards to 8,000 packets per second, no matter what computer it's running on. Mm. 
Um, yeah. it's just interrupt. Interrupt. For all types of interrupt. BGE has different values, so it behaves differently. SIS has what, different. What are some of those values? We have over 100 network drivers in the tree. Uh, I don't know the characteristics of them all off the top of my head. What are the more fast? The, the, fast <coughs> um, the fastest in the fastest gigabit controller I have played with is the Broadcom Net Extreme Twos. Um, they're really fast. I don't know what they mitigate to though. I haven't had a chance to test with this to see what the behavior is. But if you want good forwarding performance, I get the NXs. Um, the next one down is a good quality BGE and your Intel gigabits. Um, I think the old school Sysconnects, the the new MSKs, I think they're all right. They're okay. Just load your head at this point, there. SK doesn't have intermediation. Well, it's fantastic then. We have sync points, so yeah. It'll just be drowned in packets per second. It is completely arbitrary. And the other problem with this is the way interrupt controllers work on computers also help to mitigate packets per second. So you can take the same network card and put it in an AMD64 and it will behave completely differently to the same system running i386. Oh no, my battery's flat. Lucky my slides are over. Almost. Um, yeah, it's very dependent on your hardware. It's very dependent on your system. It's very dependent on which architecture you're running the computer on. Like the i386 AMD64, if you have a Spark 64, it behaves differently again um, for all sorts of things. So the packets per second is very strongly tied to how many interrupts your network card will generate, but the factors that are affected are many and varied. For now. For now. For now. There's a whip talk this afternoon everyone should come to. Anyone else got questions? Yes, Mark. I did. Um, with the, uh, the addition of the timestamp, yep. if you're doing active-active firewalling, um, how important is it to sync the time of all the cluster firewalls? Um, it determines the timestamp on the PO sync state on itself. So when you get the packet in, it takes the timestamp from the local computer. Yes. It doesn't receive it from the other side. Um, so if it receives a PF sync packet um, within four seconds of its own update to it, it determines that locally and sends it out. It doesn't trust the time from the other computer at all. It doesn't care. It just cares about when it receives events itself. Okay. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Come on. Yes. What uh, what commercial firewalls actually do active active firewall yeah. properly? Absolutely no idea. I would care if I ran them at work, but I don't. So I wrote the code to fix a problem I have at work. Um, Claudio, do you know? There are a couple of ones. Are they good? Uh, normally, their active active setup is built around uh, load balancers in front and behind the boxes so that the load balancers are actually splitting the traffic up to the, the, the firewalls so that you don't have split views. And then you just can have like tons of firewalls, but we could do the same. That's true. You need more boxes for that. But you? yeah, you, you instead of having two boxes, you suddenly have like eight because you want to have some redundancy on the load balancers and on your firewalls, and it's just like massive hardware mayhem. I don't know. It's okay, that sort of makes sense. Any other questions? Yeah, I think we were one of the first um, firewalls to actually do staple failover in like six. Yeah. And um, so, have you tested this with IPv6? Is there any difference at all? I can honestly say I haven't broken anything relative to IPv6. Um, the states are an opaque object to me from the point of view of PF sync. So, what's inside of that is the IPv6 information. Yes. I haven't peeked inside or changed anything inside that opaque object. So, we still do completely stateful failover for IPv6. There's been no regression there. But you'll also be able to do active active shortly with IPv6. Come on, you've got a question, I know. Yep. Uh, anything else? All right. Thank you.